Welcome everyone to today's webinar. We are really, really excited to see such a big audience um, speaking to the importance of this topic for therapists. And the title, as you know, is Understanding Lewy Body Dementia, the Role of PT, OT, and the SLP in Person-Centered Care. My name is Laura Gousset. I'll be your moderator for tonight. And I just wanna welcome you on behalf of LSVT Global. And this webinar is brought to you as a collaborative event between LSVT Global and the Lewy Body Dementia Association. And with that, I'll introduce Julia, who will be welcoming you from them. Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us. On behalf of everyone at the Lewy Body Dementia Association, I'd like to thank you all for taking your time to attend tonight. So like I said, my name is Laura Gousset. I'm one of the LSVT BIG faculty and the chief clinical officer of LSVT BIG for LSVT Global. And in tonight's webinar, you're, you are going to be hearing from a panel of experts. Uh, first, you'll be hearing from Dr. Jennifer Goldman, who is a physician, and Julia will introduce her, and uh, she'll also introduce herself in a pre-recorded video that she is sharing on the background of Lewy body dementia. Also joining us tonight are Heather Siance, a physical therapist and one of our LSVT BIG certification faculty. Julia, who you just met, who uh, has two roles here, serving both as LSVT BIG faculty, as an occupational therapist, and she's the director of professional and community education for the LBDA. And also we're joined by another Heather, Heather Hodges, who's one of our um, expert LSVT Loud training and certification faculty for LSVT Global. So just a bit of a brief background on all of us. As I said, I'm a physical therapist and I've always had a passion for treating people with Parkinson's and other neurodegenerative disorders. I've been teaching LSVT Big around the world since 2011 and I'm behind the scenes a lot in LSVT Global with webinars, curriculum development, and so on. So I'll be presenting a small portion of tonight's um, webinar towards the end. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Julia, who's gonna introduce herself and tell you also a little bit about Dr. Goldman. Excellent. Welcome everyone. So as I said, you know, this event is very special to me. Um, this is kind of a merging of worlds for me in, in ways. Um, dementia, um, October is Lewy Body Dementia Awareness Month. And so I'm really honored to be able to collaborate with everyone here at LSBT Global um, and bring this webinar to you. I was fortunate enough in my clinical practice to be part of an amazing interdisciplinary team with my co-presenter tonight, Heather Cianci at the University of Pennsylvania's Parkinson's Disease and Movement Disorder Center for Excellence. And Heather introduced me to um, LSVT Global in 2013, and I became faculty in 2018. And so through this, I really discovered my love of professional education and also working with Heather in such a great clinical environment, I really became passionate about treating these um, these very complex conditions. And I just wanted to say that I've seen estimates that up to 80% of OTs do not feel confident in their skills treating dementia. And so I really hope that tonight's presentation will leave you all feeling more confident and inspired to treat these families living with this complex condition. Um, as Laura mentioned, tonight's presentation will begin with an overview of Lewy body dementia by Dr. Jennifer Goldman. Dr. Goldman serves as a chairperson of the LBDA Scientific Advisory Council, and she also chairs our clinical care and professional education working group. I'm pleased to hand over the microphone to my colleague, friend, and I like to call her my sister from another mister, Heather Cianci. <laughs> Thank you so much, Julia. And I apologize, my uh, camera is not working today. Uh, you get to see the other three lovelies. I am hiding here. I actually did come out of my pajamas for this event, so I'm, I'm sorry that you're not getting to see me in all of my glory, but um, like Julia said, we really, we were very fortunate to work together at a comprehensive, um, really patient-centered care clinic at the University of Pennsylvania's Dan Aaron Parkinson's Rehab Center, and very lucky that we have a team of 
PT, OT, and speech who work not only with individuals with Parkinson's disease, which you are all familiar with, with using LSVT big and LSVT loud, but we also have a subspecialty in the atypical Parkinsonisms, of which Lewy body dementia is considered one. And, uh, you know, being able to provide that level of care on an interdisciplinary level is something that we really strive for in LSVT global, and it's something that we strive for in our clinic. So I've been very fortunate to be using LSVT big in my practice since 2007 and have been an instructor along with the other team members here since um, 2011. And again, we are so pleased to have you. And I want to give a little nod to the, you know, PTs tend to be the ones who we, who we think about, you know, we're getting people up, we're getting them moving, we're getting them active. And sometimes we overlook that PT also has a role in working with people with dementia. And there probably isn't a great comfort level, um, I would say, like Julia said, with OT, probably a little bit lower in PT. So I hope that you do walk away with some great information for this evening. Now, our other panel, Heather Hodges, our speech language pathologist. Well, I am just absolutely honored and delighted to be here today to present on this team for um, uh, the advocacy and education of treating Lewy body dementia. So I have been um, a part of the LSVT Loud research team since 2004 and have been a faculty instructor. Um, since 2007 and one of the highlights to what I'm able to do when I present is when LSVT Loud and LSVT Big are in the same spot and we all get to put our heads together and be in person. And so it's been great to collaborate um, on this presentation. I, in addition to working for LSVT Loud as a consultant, I have worked in the patient world, um, treating a variety of swallowing disorders, dysphonia, upper airway disorders. Those have really been my specialty area. And within that, I have treated patients with co-occurring um, dementia, and in particular, LSVT loud um, with patients with dementia or Lewy body dementia in particular, I have clinical experience. And so I will echo that uh, while cognition and dementia may be an area of specialty for some speech pathologists for those SLPs specializing in voice therapy, it may not be something that is always so comfortable. And so I hope to be able to shed some light and some resources so that those um, clinicians who maybe have more of a specialty in, in voice within the SLP world feel more comfortable addressing dementia in their care um, as it relates to LSVT loud, um, swallowing, dysphagia, and other areas of treatment. So thanks for having me tonight. All right. Well, thank you all. And I'm just excited to have all of you on our webinar tonight. I know you all have vast clinical experience and uh, hopefully have some great pearls of information. Well, I know you do that you'll be sharing with our audience tonight. Just some brief disclosures. The faculty has both financial and non-financial relationships with LSVT Global. Um, Ms. Yance, Ms. Hodges, and Ms. Wood are consultants for LSVT Global and receive lecture honorarium. I myself am an employee of LSVT Global, and please see Dr. Goldman's link here that she's listed for her own disclosures. Just a few logistics before we get started. You might have joined us before for a webinar if you're an LSVT certified clinician. Um, right now, all of your microphones are muted so that there's no background noises from your different environments. But at the end, we'll have a 15-minute Q&A session. So feel free to um, jot down your questions. You can type them in any time in your control panel. And we'll go through as many questions as we can at the end of today's webinar. And that'll be a um, Q&A session that you'll be able to ask questions of any of the panelists and Dr. B Goldman as well. If we don't get to all of your questions, you'll be able to email us at info at lsvtglobal.com or you can um, even leave your questions on the survey and we'll be sure to get back to you. Um, there are some handouts you can see in your control panel. There's a handouts tab. You can download the slides from tonight's presentation in PDF form. 
Um, you can also find some different handouts in there. There's two that Julia has provided on behalf of the Lewy Body Dementia Association. And there's another handout from us that you can share with your patients. So please feel free to save those, download those, share those as much as you'd like. At the very end of the webinar, there'll be a quick survey to fill out, and I'll give you a little bit more information about that at, at the end. In terms of continuing education activity, these are not pre-approved or pre-registered for CEUs for PTs, OTs, and SLPs, but we will give you a certificate of completion after um, this webinar. The webinar is two hours in length, so as long as you complete the full um, webinar length, we'll send you an electronic certificate. It might take us up to a week or two to um, email those to you. If you're not sure if your state accepts self-reported CEUs, the best thing to do is check with your state board on that. These are the learning objectives that we'll be going through tonight. Um, Dr. Goldman will talk to you about Lewy body dementia so that you'll be able to define that. Differentiate dementia with Lewy bodies from Parkinson's disease dementia. Summarize research-based PT, OT, and speech therapy considerations specific to working with people with LBD. Recognize the rationale of how LSVT loud and LSVT big can improve communication, ADLs, and mobility in people with LBD. And then lastly, we'll be talking about how you can build stronger interprofessional therapy teams to help people with LBD. So we welcome you, whether you're an LSVT certified clinician or if you're a, a different type of therapist that's not yet certified or a different healthcare professional, um, whoever you are joining us tonight, we welcome you. And we're gonna start today's webinar off with a, a presentation. It's a pre-recorded video by Dr. Jennifer Goldman. She wasn't able to join us at this time and wa wanted to be sure to get this information to you. This is a 22 minute long video. Um, this webinar is being recorded. So for some reason, it's not playing well on your device um, because of internet speed or anything like that. Please know that it will be recorded and on, available on demand about two days after this webinar is done. So with that, I'm going to share this great presentation and we'll pick up after that. Hello, and welcome to today's program. My name is Dr. Jennifer Goldman, and I'm delighted to welcome you today. I am the Section Chief of Parkinson's Disease and Movement Disorders at Shirley Ryan Ability Lab, formerly the Rehabilitation Institute of Chicago. I'm a professor in the Departments of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation and Neurology at Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine. I am pleased to be the director of our Lewy Body Dementia Association Research Center of Excellence. It has been the, my privilege as a clinician and researcher in my career of almost 20 years to provide care to people living with Lewy Body Dementia and their families. And as a researcher to work on advancing the field for people living with Lewy to bring therapeutic advances, better diagnoses and better management. Today, I'm going to share a brief overview and introduction to Lewy body dementia. When we think about cognitive changes over time or with aging, we can think about that some people may have mild changes in attention or short-term memory or minor word finding difficulty that have been associated with quote unquote normal aging. However, this is not always the case and people may have changes that are more than expected for what we see in aging per se. This can take the form of mild cognitive impairment or dementia. When we talk about mild cognitive impairment or MCI, we see cognitive changes that are more than what is expected for getting older, but they are mild and someone is so, still fully independent in their day-to-day -day life. When we talk about dementia, we are referring to changes in cognition that affect multiple areas, such as memory, attention, executive function, language, or visual spatial functions, or some combination of these. These changes are significant enough to impact someone's day-to-day -day function and their ability to achieve a level of independence. 
Mild cognitive impairment is often an earlier or prodromal stage to people who go on to develop dementia. When we think about dementia, dementia is really an umbrella term used to describe a range of symptoms associated with cognitive impairment. When we think about dementia, often people associate this with Alzheimer's disease, which is one of the most common forms of dementia, as you can see here. However, it is not the only form and not all dementia equals Alzheimer's. Today, we're going to talk about Lewy body dementia, which represents 10 to 25% of the dementias. It affects about 1.4 million Americans. So what's in a name? What is Lewy body dementia? You may hear a number of different terms, such as Lewy body dementia, dementia with Lewy bodies, Lewy body disease, DLB, LBD, and it can sometimes be confusing. You may also wonder how this is different or similar to Parkinson's disease and Parkinson's disease dementia. We'll talk about some of these definitions in a moment. As the field has advanced, as, as the field has advanced, we've often now associated this mild cognitive impairment as a precursor to dementia as you can see with mild cognitive impairment with Lewy bodies in Parkinson's disease, mild cognitive impairment representing early stages that may go on to a dementia syndrome. So let's talk about the vocabulary of Lewy body dementia. Lewy body dementia refers to the clinical syndrome. It is an umbrella term representing both Parkinson's disease with dementia or PDD and dementia with Lewy bodies or DLB. Both of those entities, Parkinson's disease, dementia, and dementia with Lewy bodies fall under the umbrella of Lewy body dementia. When we talk about Lewy body disease, we're not referring to the clinical picture, but we're really referring to what we see in pathology, in the brain or parts of the nervous system, such as under a microscope. With a microscope, we can see evidence of what are called Lewy bodies, and changes in neurons or neuronal loss. The Lewy body was discovered by a pathologist and named after him who lived in the early 1900s. Here you can see a cartoon of a Lewy body in a neuron. And in the middle panel, you can see what it looks like under a microscope with special stains. It has a special characteristic that can be identified. These Lewy bodies can be found in aggregates or protein clumps in different parts of the brain, such as the brain stem and in the cortical parts or cortex of the brain. There's something called the one-year rule that you might hear about that refers to how we might differentiate clinically Parkinson's disease dementia from dementia with Lewy bodies. They are both under this umbrella of LBD and they share many clinical features and often cannot be distinguished from one another. But this one-year rule has been applied in criteria that have been developed over the decades. The one-year rule refers to the presence and timing of cognitive symptoms versus motor symptoms. We talk about Parkinson's disease dementia when someone first has motor symptoms of Parkinson's or a well-established diagnosis of Parkinson's disease and later on goes on to develop dementia. In contrast, if someone starts with dementia about the same time or before they might develop motor symptoms, that may be referred to as dementia with Lewy bodies. Clinically, pathologically, and with many biomarkers, these two conditions look very, very similar. But the one-year rule has been uh, helpful for the criteria and perhaps also in some research studies. Let's talk about diagnosing these conditions. It is important to screen for and monitor cognition in Parkinson's disease. While not everyone with Parkinson's will go on to develop cognitive changes or certain types of symptoms, with advancing disease, studies have shown that up to 80% of people followed over many years, such as 15 or 20 years with Parkinson's may develop dementia in their lifetime. This risk is four to six times higher than those without Parkinson's disease. And PDD or Parkinson's disease dementia may be preceded by this stage of mild cognitive impairment that we talked about. 
dementia with Lewy bodies or DLB is underrecognized and underdiagnosed, as many of you may appreciate. On average, it may take 18 months and up to three doctors or more to receive a correct diagnosis. This has made people say that DLB is one of the most misdiagnosis, misdiagnosed forms of dementia. With the presence of both cognitive and motor symptoms, it also has been known to be one of the most expensive forms of dementia. To diagnose someone with DLB based on criteria developed over the past several decades and most recently updated in 2017, there must be enough cognitive decline to impair daily activities plus two of the following core clinical features. Parkinsonism with motor symptoms listed here, visual hallucinations, which may be well-formed complex visions, such as of people or animals that are not really truly present in the environment. People may have sleep changes, such as REM behavior disorder, where while asleep, they may be acting out their dreams. Interestingly, this can occur decades before other symptoms. People with DLB can often have cognitive fluctuations with changes in their level of arousal or alertness or looking like they're zoning out with fluctuations from day to day or week to week. These symptoms can also occur in Parkinson's disease, which makes it sometimes difficult to establish that diagnosis. If there's only one core clinical feature, then additional testing may be ordered. You may have heard of some of these tests. The DAT scan is a nuclear medicine type brain imaging study that, that um, identifies the dopamine levels within certain parts of the brain. We can also conduct sleep studies overnight to see how someone's sleeping and whether there or not there is the presence of REM sleep behavior disorder or other sleep disturbances. Less commonly is a special type of cardiac scan called the MIBG that is not widely available in many places, but can uh, detect certain changes present in DLB. Again, all of these tests can also be abnormal in Parkinson's disease. There are other clinical features that we know can occur in Lewy body dementias, uh, including the cognitive, sleep, and motor ones that we spoke about, but also other neuropsychiatric symptoms, such as depression, anxiety, or apathy, sensory changes in vision or smell, and autonomic changes affecting blood pressure, bladder, and bowels. We approach Lewy body dementias with a symptom-based management approach often requiring a team approach with multiple care providers with different expertise. We can look at medications that might be helpful for these symptoms, as well as non-pharmacologic therapies, including physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech language pathology, and other av avenues such as exercise. It is also important to remember that psychosocial avenues can be helpful in management such as with social workers, psychologists, and psychiatrists as well. And of course, research plays a very important role. So I'd like to talk a little bit about the symptoms of Lewy body dementia and their management, in particular from the perspective of a movement disorders neurologist. As you can see here, there are a number of symptoms associated with Lewy body dementia that affect neuropsychiatric symptoms, as well as autonomic disturbances and sleep. On this slide in particular, you can see that only a handful of these symptoms have FDA approved treatments with medications. Thus, there is a great opportunity for further research into medications and other strategies, including non-pharmacologic ones, to treat these non-motor and neuropsychiatric symptoms. To talk a little bit about cognitive problems, it's important to have objective assessments, not only at baseline, but over time, and to gather information from not only the person with Lewy body dementia, but also a reliable informant. If someone has acute changes in cognition or new onset cognitive problems or decline, we may want to exclude other causes, particularly if it's in the setting of a marked change. So some of those causes might be infections or new medications or mood changes. 
It's always important as a physician and other healthcare team members to review medications and other things that might be going on with that person that could contribute to cognitive problems. We may consider medications for cognitive symptoms or dementia as listed here. And it is very important to address other factors such as safety at home, driving abilities, work if someone's working and appropriate adjustments as well as the important impact psychosocially that these symptoms can have not only on the person living with Lewy body dementia, but their caregiver. Non-pharmacologic strategies can address cognitive problems, and many of these can come from the rehabilitation team, as well as the psychosocial elements with our social worker team, psychology, and other uh, healthcare professionals. In, in a sense, there's an opportunity for everyone to play a role in addressing cognitive challenges in Lewy body dementia patients. Another aspect to recognize and address are the cognitive fluctuations and that these may occur from day to day or week to week. And people may change over time in their attention, alertness and cognition and how to handle that not only in uh, management or in therapy sessions or at home become an important aspect of discussion and treatment planning. In terms of psychosis, which can be a hallmark of Lewy body dementia, this encompasses not only illusions or misperceptions, but also hallucinations, such as those formed objects or people or animals not present that I mentioned before, as well as delusions or fixed and false beliefs, such as someone being unfaithful to their spouse, paranoia or suspiciousness among others. When these occur, particularly acutely, as physicians, we often think we might need to treat uh, and detect an underlying medical illness, particularly an infection like a urinary tract infection. We may need to discontinue medications that can exacerbate hallucinations and sometimes these medicines are those very ones that are used to treat the motor symptoms. So this can be a delicate balance. There's a role for non-pharmacological strategies in managing psychosis across a spectrum, knowing that it can be mild to also really quite marked and impairing and disturbing to both the patient and the care partner. Some of these can involve techniques uh, related to the home environment, looking at different uh, uh, elements for lighting, uh, looking at uh, minimizing uh, clutter and distraction to keep the environment simple. One can work on psychosocial strategies with reassurance or even humor if that's indicated. There's a whole host of opportunities there. And then we may consider certain medications to treat these symptoms as well as avoiding dopamine blocking medicines that can worsen Parkinsonism. To talk a little bit about mood and behavior issues and management, some of these symptoms primarily encompass depression, anxiety as mood disorders, as well as apathy, which can be really quite tricky and challenging. Apathy indeed may uh, be more problematic for someone's care partner rather than the patient, uh, the patient themselves. We may see, particularly in later stages, agitation or aggression or different behaviors. As well as uh, the other motor symptoms and non-motor symptoms that I've mentioned so far, these merit screening and monitoring. In more recent years, we've also recognized a higher risk of suicidality. So that is an important topic to recognize clues uh, that might indicate this, as well as to screen patients for uh, suicidal ideation and plans. There may be medications for mood and behavior issues, mainly drawn from the general population. And many of these symptoms such as depression or anxiety are quite treatable. There may be a role for cognitive behavioral therapy, depending on one's level of cognitive abilities and psychosocial support plays an essential role in uh, Lewy body dementia care, particularly when mood and behavior issues are present. There can be a role for non-pharmacologic strategies, addressing mood, addressing uh, physical exercise and other activities, as well as effects of various therapies that can help boost mood and have calming effects. We often think in Parkinsonian syndromes of treating the motor features, whether those might be changes in gait, slowness, stiffness, or tremor. 
And there is a role for Parkinsonian medications in Lewy body dementias. We certainly recognize this role in Parkinson's disease in treating the motor symptoms, but in the presence of dementia or DLB, one must need to have some uh, caution in using these medications in going uh, slow in the dose and cautiously because we need to balance the motor and mental functions, recognizing that sometimes dopaminergic medications, although helpful for motor symptoms, can aggravate psychosis and neuropsychiatric symptoms. There's a role for non-pharmacologic therapies to treat motor symptoms as well recognized, including, uh, but not limited to, the role of physical therapy and rehabilitation, as well as exercise. We also wanna emphasize reducing fall and injury risk and looking at home safety to address these concerns. Sleep disorders are a large uh, category of symptoms and include both nighttime issues and daytime trouble. Looking at REM sleep behavior disorder and nighttime travel, uh, there can be a role for a variety of different medications, but I wanted to stress that it's important to think about the bedroom environment and safety, such as taking a look at the home. Daytime sleepiness can be a bit of a challenge, and I've also illustrated this here with fatigue, albeit a separate issue. Uh, daytime sleepiness can often be associated with increasing cognitive impairment and dementia, as well as other neuropsychiatric symptoms, such as psychosis, apathy, and mood changes. Medications may be helpful for promoting wakefulness, as well as reducing medicines that could contribute to daytime sleepiness. Non-pharmacologic strategies can uh, play a role in the management with looking at how one uh, plans one's day looking at energy conservation strategies and uh, activities to keep someone stimulated and awake during the day, as well as calm and restful at night. There are numerous autonomic symptoms that can be present in Parkinsonian syndromes, such as Lewy body dementia. To highlight a few here, orthostatic hypotension, bladder dysfunction, constipation, and others. And these may each have their individual medication strategies uh, with different types of pharmacologic agents to help these issues. There is also a role for looking at these from a non-pharmacologic approach, whether this has to do with uh, compression stockings or elevation of the head of the bed, but also physical activity and how one gets up from a chair or out of bed. There can be a role for looking at uh, pelvic health therapy to uh, work on genitourinary and bladder dysfunction. So there's a lot that we can do together as a team. Knowledge is power. We know that not everyone with Lewy body dementias will have the same symptoms. People can be very individual in the symptoms they have and in their progression. We also know that these topics can be difficult to talk about or hear about, but we also know that accurate definitions, diagnoses, and information and education are important to someone and their family. Management strategies, comprehensive team care with interdisciplinary teams and research can make all the difference. When we think about dementia, often we think about what someone has lost or has changed, and we think about deficits. However, that can be often quite detrimental to think about just what someone has lost. People have many preserved strengths. There may be activities they can do independently, and it may be helpful to think about activities that someone might be able to do with various degrees of accommodation or assistance that can help maintain their quality of life and engagement. Often this comes about with working with some of our rehabilitation care team. To close, I'd like to offer this quote from Michael Belleville that I find very quite compelling. People who have been given this diagnosis can still contribute, learn, and live a meaningful life. They also still have a voice, even if they cannot communicate it in the way that it could before. Please remember that dementia is a disease, not a personality trait. With this, I'd like to close and thank you very much for your attention. And it's an exciting session that we have ahead of us. Greetings from Chicago 
and Shirley Ryan Ability Lab and Northwestern. All right, well, hopefully that came through well and uh, that was a great presentation. And now I'm going to turn the webinar over to Heather. Thank you so much, Laura. Um, that was just an amazing presentation by Dr. Goldman. She really is um, an expert in this. So I'm really thankful for her time. So she spoke a lot about what the, the role of therapy is and how we really have some, some big shoes to fill in supportive roles for what we can do to help people live the best quality of life. So we wanted to take a look and start with talking to you about what is the literature support for therapy in Lewy body dementia. So let's take a look at the next slide and think about what are the considerations that we have for physical therapy professionals. So when we synthesize the research and we put that all together, what do we wanna think about in the back of our minds for that? Next slide. One of the things that's really important to remember in this population of people is that the presence of frailty in the early stages of DLB is nearly double that of Alzheimer's or even Parkinson's disease. Now, the development of the frailty itself is not really attributable to the disease pathophysiology. It's really due to a lot of the changes that happen to the patient when we look at what's going on around them because of what's going on within them, okay? Reduce social engagement. Okay, that cognitive problem, the difficulty with being able to converse, that leads to them having less environmental stimulation, less time out, less people, less things to talk to, to see, to be engaged in. And when they have that lessening of the social engagement and the environmental stimulation because of those cognitive changes, that's gonna lessen their activity levels. And then when they're less active, now we're not moving as much. Now we're probably not exercising as much. We're not getting around as much. And that really will lead to a negative impact on strength. There are so many other issues that go on with this when people are losing mobility, the um, amount of falls that can lead to an actual injury or a fracture, those behavioral disturbances when people are becoming agitated or scared or the anxiety is there, the depression is there, and then also problems with malnutrition. And Heather Hodges is going to talk to you a little bit later about um, speech and swallowing and how that impacts. Next slide. People with dementia have a lot of falls. We know that our folks with movement disorders really do struggle with the quality and the mechanics of their gait. Between 60 to 80% of people with dementia fall each year. And unfortunately, a lot of our folks with any of the movement disorders who have falls really don't see themselves as likely to fall even though they've had many falls or they're even expressing concerns about the falls. This tends to become almost like a family affair where falls or near falls tend to become normalized. Um, it was my own silly fault. I didn't fall. I landed on the couch or anyone would have fallen in that situation or, you know, I just wasn't sure where I was. It was a, it was a new place. It was low lighting, lots of different reasons. And some of them may be true. There are environmental situations that make people more likely to fall, but these balance deficits, this bradykinesia, this hypokinesia, and these cognitive changes really do get in deep with these folks. And these effects on balance and gait are really seen very early in the course of the diseases that have a role and a part of dementia. Next slide. So when we're looking at functional mobility, we have to think about the impact of the disease related changes. So what is happening with the person with the Lewy body dementia? Dr. Goldman talked about the sleep disturbances. She mentioned the mood disorders, the apathy, um, the difference in their performance ability, right? It's very variable. It could be very different from one hour to the next, one day to the next, what they're able to do, um, depending on hallucinations, again, on mood, and again, on fatigue. So we talked about the frailty and the fatigue, again, running very deeply through this. So we really need to do a good job as physical therapists to really um, assess mobility if we are not a home care therapist, like myself, I'm an outpatient therapist, I need to assess mobility 
as close as I can to how the home setup is. And this is important because, again, repetition and task specificity are very important for training and learning and processing in this population. So we want to set up the bed at the height generally of what height the bed is. We want people to get in and out of bed on the same side. We want them to use the handrail on the stairs as the same way that they do at home. And we wanna look at them first without queuing, so just assess what they're able to do. And then when they have a deficit or a problem in that quality of movement, we wanna see what is their ability to actually follow through with our queuing. So are they able to take what we are giving them, process it, and then actually implement it? Dual tasking. Again, we talk about this a lot in LSVT Big, um, and if you just work with um, anybody in the neurological population, you know how important this is to be able to do two tasks at once, sometimes even more tasks. The ability to be able to turn one's head while taking a large step, being able to um, take something out of your pocket while you're walking, maybe reaching to turn on and off the lights. We have to see if people are safe in that situation. The other thing that's very, very important is we really do need to assess the care partner, the family members, the home health aides, the nursing aides, whoever is working with that client to see what their technique is on how they're physically helping that person, but also how they are, you know, talking to that person and what is the tone of their voice and what is the verbiage they're using. Are they speaking calmly? Are they keeping it simple? Are they rushing the person? Are they making them feel more anxious? So there's a high level of education that goes into getting those people who are helping that patient, who are with them far more than we are able to in therapy, to do the best job that they can to really encourage that patient to keep that quality of life. And again, we have to look at what are the barriers to being able to improve or even maintain the function that have been trialed before or recommended. You know, maybe they had therapy in the past and they tried a certain device or they tried a certain technique and it really did not go well for them and they really did not see improvement or maybe it caused more fear and anxiety. So getting to know that whole of the person with that person-centered care. And again, the key to this treatment, right, with these folks who have dementia, for them to be able to process and learn and retain is consistency, repetition, and simplicity. And we're going to talk more about that, I think, with all three of the disciplines. Next slide. When you're thinking about what do I do as a set of outcome measurement tools? You know, is there something that's more specialized to this population of people? There is not a core measurement standard for people with Lewy body dementia, but we do have a core set of outcome measurement tools for adults with neurological conditions. And the Academy of Neurological Physical Therapy, you can take a look at the APTA's website. It lists them there for us. The Berg, the Functional Gait, the Activities Specific Balance Confidence Scale, 10 meter walk, six minute walk test, and the five times sit to stand. Other things that you wanna keep in the back of your mind too to also consider is if you have someone who's much more frail, much more deconditioned, you could change that six minute walk into the two minute walk. And I personally really like doing the timed up and go for my folks with Lewy body um, because it does look at the dual tasking. So we're having them do not only the timed up and go, but it's also with a dual task of a cognitive task and a dual task of a motor task. So again, gives me some nice insight into how well or not well they're doing when they're challenged at a higher level. Next slide. So I think you really need to kind of think about your physical therapy focus at the top of the line. It is all about function. We have to keep these people as function based as possible for as long as possible, right? So it's about the walking, it's about the transfers, it's about getting up from the floor, it's about being able to reach and open up the refrigerator to get in and out of the car. And the way to keep that going is through physical fitness. So that's gonna be some regimen of exercise of which you divide and divine for that patient because you have to find something that works for them, something that's salient and important for them. Behind all of that, of course, your background is the safety. Can this patient safely perform this? How am I doing with training my care partners? And we're really, it's a, a heavy amount of education. Um, just like Dr. Goldman said, you know, this isn't a personality trait. They're not doing this on purpose. And it often can feel like that with the care partners because of the variability in cognition. 
one day they're doing well, the next moment they're not doing well, and they almost feel like they're doing it in spite. So a lot of education about how this is the course of the disease. So we work to educate them. We work to motivate these people because again, feeling like there's so much loss, we have to get in there and kind of bring them up. And then we also really have to work to communicate. And on wonderful technique if you're not aware at this TED Med talk from 2017. Um, this is a couple um, they did in life is they were comics and they actually used comedy to help deal with the one um, partners, her mom and dad both had Alzheimer's and they use a technique called yes and meaning when someone's I can take care of that. When we constantly are saying no to people with dementia, we're taking a sense of self from them, right? They're being told, no, you can't do this. You can't eat that. You can't do this by yourself. So many no's by actually deferring and kind of changing things and being more supportive and just sort of changing, you know, the direction of where you're speaking. Yes. And how can I help you? It can be very helpful. The last one is, of course, collaboration. I don't think you can do a great job of teaching and working with a family member or someone with dementia without having that full team. So if you have the ability to team up with your OT and speech language pathologist, go for it. Next slide. So let's take a look at what physical therapy research is out there. Um, unfortunately, there isn't a great deal. Let's look at the next slide and we'll talk about the limitations that are out there. Um, unfortunately, the majority of studies that are out there will say we don't want people with dementia in here. So um, the first one here, just a simple study where they looked at eight subjects. They said that treadmill training was feasible and safe, again, if done correctly with proper training and safety, um, but a systematic review of look at this number of articles, how many were reviewed and almost 90% of folks were ineligible for exclusion because they had dementia. And when you synthesize that all down, you're left with five studies with 16 subjects. That's not a lot to go off of. And it says here that, that that functional capacity of Lewy body dementia um, participants within the studies is reported to be relatively low in comparison with similar cohorts. So again, I think the one strength that research shows us is these people, the frailty and the weakness and the problems that they have start early and again can run deep without intervention. Next slide. This, I had to put this in because this was a wonderful case report from 2020, and it, it, it really, if you get a chance to read this, please do so. Um, in brief, this was a, a very elderly gentleman, 87 with DLB, um, and he had an also an exacerbation while he was in the nursing home of his underlying frailty due to sarcopenia, so weakening, malnutrition, polypharmacy, and then also being isolated and being immobile. So the team took a look. They had an entire um, interdisciplinary team look at trying to reduce the number of medications he was on. Nine were actually stopped. The nutritionist and speech pathologist worked on high energy, high protein diet, really reevaluating his need for the pureed diet because there really was no evidence of aspiration. They worked him through the weeks up to a wonderful high intensity progressive resistance program. Look at that, for one hour, three times a week. He was able to show improvement in his skeletal muscle index, his weight. He actually improved cognitively on his mini mental state examination and on his physical ability on the short physical performance battery and went from being wheelchair bound and almost emaciated from the pictures in the article to being able to ambulate with contact guard. Now here's the bad news is, Following up 18 months later, when you take away that intervention, everything was reversed. I don't think I'm telling you anything you don't need to know, but we underdose people, we underhelp these folks, and that patient-centered care really needs to come to the forefront. Next slide. So this is an upcoming study that uh, I believe that they are still recruiting for, and this is promoting independence in Lewy body dementia through exercise. It's called the PRIDE study. And basically, you can take a look here at this intervention where they're doing static balance, they're doing dual tasking, they're doing dynamic balance, um, they're doing, again, functional training, importance of gait and transfers, and again, going back to a high-intensity progressive resistance training. You can take a look at those outcome measures that are there, but they're looking at things like strength, 
quality of life, physical performance, cognition, and depression. So while there are not a lot of studies that are out there, here is a good one to be um, looking for on the horizon. And now I'd like to pass the next portion over to my colleague, Julia Wood, to talk about occupational therapy. Thank you so much, Heather. Wonderful job. And I think that you can really see, you know, all the considerations from what Dr. Goldman talked about as far as the symptoms, from the frailty and falls, that there truly is so much for all of us to do. Next slide. And so I wanted to start here as, as far as how um, the American Occupational Therapy Association has really defined the role of for us as OTs in dementia care. And first, we can really focus on health promotion. So, you know, just like Heather mentioned, it's really looking at, at the strengths of the client, promoting the wellness for both the client and the care partner so that we can really maximize their performance to help them live their life to its fullest. Um, when we talk about remediation, it's really important to note that we're not expecting to remediate cognitive skills. So we're not trying to improve their memory or improve their attention. Um, that, that is not part of, of the treatment plan and we'll kind of look at that more in some of the other studies and, and guides that I bring up. Um, but we can incorporate routine exercise to to really help improve both the performance of their functional mobility tasks, their activities of daily living, and then help restore their range of motion and strength and endurance. Um, we also want to make sure that we're trying to provide all the supports needed for the habits and routines that are really working well for that person so that we can maintain um, independence as long as possible for them. And then lastly, you know, we always have to look at the task in both the environment and how we may modify um, through adaptation or compensatory measures, maybe, you know, safety measures, durable medical equipment, um, but this can also include training and verbal cueing, um, training the care partner or a home health aide, how to give personal assistance and or provide the social supports that the individual needs. Next slide. And I just wanted to point out here that, you know, this, this review found that we really should avoid spending time on activities that have not demonstrated any improvement in outcomes with dementia, such as trying to do cognitive retraining, which I mentioned a moment ago. But instead, on the next slide, how cognitive rehabilitation is defined for dementia, if you're thinking of that, is really working to identify functional goals that are meaningful to the person who's living with dementia and working with the individual and their family to help them achieve these. So that's really what cognitive rehabilitation looks like, is not trying to rehabilitate individual cognitive skills, but really work on things that are meaningful and functional for the person. Next slide. Um, and then they go a little deeper into this here that, you know, we've all talked about these person-centered approaches uh, where we're trying to optimize the environment and the task, really support those family carers that we know in dementia with the Lewy bodies, there's a much greater burden. And so we're working on, you know, needs and goal-based self-management when possible, and then trying to always provide that case management model as much as we can. Um, because just like Heather said, when you take away the supports, when you take away the intervention, the quality of life really does suffer almost immediately. Next slide. And I think this one, you know, from the NICE guidelines as well is great that, you know, we want to look at independence, especially with mobility and functional mobility for people with dementia. Um, our care plans should always address their activities of daily living so that we're trying to maximize independence, even if that means modified independence or maybe just verbal cues or a little bit of physical assist, because we want to ultimately enhance their function, you know, work to adapt to their strengths as much as possible and minimize supports as much as we can. And then I think this one's really important here at the bottom. We're going to delve a little deeper into this. When we're thinking about care plans for people with Lewy body dementia, the varying needs of the different types of dementia have to be addressed. So I'm going to go a little deeper into how dementia with Lewy bodies looks different than, say, Alzheimer's. Next slide. So this was a comparison study that really looked at functional impairments in DLB compared to Alzheimer's. 
and you'll notice there were you know 84 people that they were doing a cross-sectional study mostly looking at their activities of daily living but then also the UPDRS the many mental and a neuropsych inventory and they found that when you compare the two patients with DLB had more functional impairments so there were more motor impairments more neuropsychiatric difficulties than the patients with Alzheimer's who had sig um, similar cognitive scores so you may see a similar cognitive profile between the two but often the impairment level is going to be more and that's important to note um, they did find that there was a correlation for both in their total activity activity of daily living score and their motor and neuropsychiatric deficits but what's interesting is they found that there were more impairments in the mobility and self-care components of the Bristol activities of daily living in DLB than with AD. And they were highly correlated with their UPDRS score. So that lets you know that when you have a client coming in, you can take a look at the UPDRS score that the movement disorder specialist has done, if you can do that chart review and really maybe get an idea of what you're going to be looking at and some of the level of impairment. And then they found that the nature of that functional disability differs between AD and DLB um, because of those impairments that you see more in mobility and self-care. And then they also thought it's really important for us as OTs, if we're looking at daily living scales for this population, we want to think about what extent are these um, impairments or disabilities related to their cognitive symptoms, their psychiatric, or their motor dysfunction. So really trying to look at the whole picture when we're assessing and intervening. Next slide. This one I found really, really interesting. So looking at the visuocognitive skill deficits in Alzheimer's compared to Lewy body. And so when we compare people with Lewy body dementia to those with Alzheimer's, what they find is that the impairment in those simple and higher order um, spatial and perceptual abilities are more severe and also appear much earlier in the disease for people with LBD. Um, DLB patients appear to have more chances to get lost both inside or outside their home. So we may need to address that training for, for um, spatial relations and orientation and navigation earlier. We also know these patients show more severe deficits on test of visuospatial skills. And especially if we're looking at, at tasks that require visual tracking and being able to, sh to shift visual attention as well. And then um, the cognitive profile of LBD patients is very much disproportionate to their impairments in attention, fluency, and their visuospatial processing. So really important to take a look at those. Um, but when you look at it, their memory, um, so their, their recall and their object naming, like on the MOCA, tends to be less affected. So that may be more of a strength. Um, and definitely you're going to see more impairments in their visuospatial skills, their visuoconstructual, and their visuoperceptual deficits. Next slide. So this is a really interesting um, systematic review. And the thing I want to point out here, you know, you'll notice that the content and the approach up in the top of really assessing early the carer and the person with dementia and doing that individual goal tailored, you know, um, um, tailored and goal directed intervention is so important. But I think what I wanted to point out more than anything is kind of the plan of care down here at the bottom. So you'll notice that the median number of sessions was around eight, but it did range from one to 12. Um, there was one trial that did a lot. They provided 24 sessions. The most common length was around one to one and a half hours, and the total intervention time ranged from around eight to 12 hours. And this was delivered over the course of five weeks to six months, um, with one study showing that intervention across two years. So this gives you kind of an idea, I think, of, of of the length of time you may need to spend. Um, also, you know, coaching both the carer and as well as the individual with dementia. Next slide. But for those of you out there who maybe fall in that 80% that aren't so confident, what I love here is that you'll notice that OT was more effective than that usual care at improving those daily living activities. Um, there were fewer behavioral and psychological symptoms in the um, people with dementia in the OT group. And then OT really resulted in a better quality of life for people than in the control groups. Um, and I love this one, the care partners 
reported doing you know fewer hours of having to assist and do things for the person with dementia. So that's hopefully going to reduce that burden a little bit. And then they also reported less distress or upset with those psychological symptoms. And there was some improvement in the carer's quality of life as well. And we know that if we can support the care partner, we're also supporting the individual with dementia as well. Next slide. So I'm not going to go really deep into this, but I just want to point this out as, as really a way of approaching clinical reasoning. And I like this study. It's not specific to DLB, but it is specific to neuropsychiatric symptom management, which is one of the more disturbing symptoms. And this is looking at, at how to approach that in a clinical setting using this DICE method, which is a patient and caregiver-centered intervention approach. Next slide. So first you want to describe. We need to do an analysis where we're looking at the person's abilities, you know, the setting, the communications and interactions, as well as whatever the demands of the activity might be. And then we're also going to have to look, of course, at all of those performance um, skills as well, um, looking at the environmental context. And in addition to doing whatever your in-person evaluation or assessment might be, we want to talk with the caregiver and get them to record issues um, and the context in which they're occurring in a diary. So we want to get an idea of what is the setting like? What is the task like? What is the environment when this person has this upset? or this issue around their psychiatric symptoms. Next slide. And so next we have to, you know, kind of get out our magnifying glass and put our, our detective hat and investigate a bit and see, you know, we've got to look at their cognitive level. And um, we talked about that in that last slide, in those last slides too, um, interviewing the caregiver and really understanding past roles for the individual. What did they do for a job? You know, what was their hobby? Um, did they participate in different religious organizations? What were their roles in the family? You need to really understand and see who that person is and then inquire as to what motivated them. So look at their daily routines, you know, including the times of day that maybe their, their fluctuations or their, their alertness or arousal is better. And then, of course, we have to consider, you know, their strengths, their mobility, their safety and falls risk and range of motion. And then we want to look at the environment in which these symptoms are occurring. Next slide. So then we have to really educate the caregiver about dementia and the symptoms and build in that communication um, to modify the environment or reduce and minimize these contributors to whatever the behavior is that we're trying to target. Um, we have to really help the caregiver understand their level, including their limitations and communication strategies, because often they really don't understand how to minimize the symptom or what's even contributing to it. Uh, we may need to recommend ways that they can simplify the environment and support the best function for the person with dementia. Next slide. And then lastly, you have to really question and dig in and see what worked, what didn't. Um, you know, did they do the strategy correctly? Was there a change in status somehow? You know, were, were there cognitive fluctuations happening? Was there a UTI and maybe some changes to cognition? Was it just not the right strategy? for that uh, relationship. And then you have to work with the other team members, see what they're noticing. And of course, if you really see symptoms of worsening cognition, you always want to report that to the supervising physician. Next slide. So these are some communication and, and cueing strategies for individuals. You know, Heather mentioned a lot of these, you know, just presenting one step at a time, trying to maintain a calm, normal tone of voice that is slow and simple in speech. Um, if you have to repeat something, try not to rephrase and reinvent it, but use the same words. Um, eye contact is so important. You know, stand in front of them. A lot of time their gaze is lowered, so you need to get on their level. You may need to provide a gentle touch on their arm to gain attention and always try to approach from the front so that you're not coming around from the side and maybe startling them. And then there is some um, evidence to support use of, of neon green, that it's high contrast for people with dementia, provides more visibility. Next slide. 
And so our focus as OTs, we're always working on those daily living tasks. You know, we're have, gonna have to consider the cognitive aspects, those visuospatial aspects within it, how to keep them safe, um, looking at what activities are meaningful, what have they given up, you know, how can we get them engaged in, in something that is motivating for them. Um, I think with safety, we always wanna consider not only the home setup, but is there access to firearms and is that safe? There have been some homicides in the last few years, you know, accidental shootings um, related to dementia, and then also driving. We always have to check and, and see if they're still driving and where and how. Um, that care partner training and support really takes a village from PT, OT, and speech to provide the education for the family, to help motivate the care partner and the individual, and communicate the best ways for successful care. And then always, I love to, to, to say teamwork really makes the dream work, so our PT and SLP colleagues can really help us maximize our treatment. Next slide. These are some screening tools that I'm not going to take time to go into, but these are some cognitive tests that you can look at um, that may give you a little bit more clear um, you know, perception of what's going on. Um, we all have different levels of comfort with doing different cognitive assessments, so it may require um, that you, you know, refer someone out for a neuropsychological test or battery. Next slide. And then these are some different outcome measures that you can use as well. Um, looking at setting goals, like we've talked about in a lot of those studies using goal attainment scaling or the banger goal setting interview. Looking at function with the COPM or your activities of daily living scales. Um, you know, looking at a different interest, past and present with the activity card sort or a task inventory. Um, and then also we can get that objective measure if we want to really see someone performing those self-care skills with the pass. Next slide. So let's look at the minimal amount of OT research here that there is, similar to PT and speech on LBD. Next slide. I love this one, um, this Hindle study looking at goal-oriented cognitive rehab. It was a pilot study, but really just looking at, you know, after goal setting, um, they, they had participants randomized to either a cognitive rehab, and remember that's those functional goals, not cognitive retraining. I'm looking at relaxation therapy or treatment as usual. And they were looking at goal attainment, um, quality of life, mood, cognition, health status, and function. And they also looked at these things for the carer as well, their goal attainment, quality of life, and stress levels. Next slide. So at two months, the cognitive rehab group was superior to the other groups, both for their goal attainment um, and the satisfaction with their goal attainment. And it was also superior to the other groups in mood, self-efficacy, the social domains of quality of life, and even the carer ratings of the participants' goal attainment. And then what's interesting is even further out at six months, they noticed there was some improvement in delayed recall, improved health status, quality of life, and care rating of goal attainment. And the care partners who participated reported improved quality of life overall, better health status, and also lower stress. So you can see how just by really focusing on function, things that are meaningful, goals that are relevant to the individual, this broad spread of effects that can really help quality of life. Next slide. Um, this is a, a great case study that I encourage you to take a look at, looking at, um, you know, task-oriented motor practice. It's a 73-year-old woman, um, two years since diagnosis, but they had thought she'd had symptoms of LBD for, or DLB for six years, um, and she was able to follow one-step commands, and the participant and the family were able to choose those three areas of goals, and they were also, this is a really intense dose, she was participating in three hours of daily intervention in the home for two weeks. Next slide. So you can see here the mini mental, the hone and yar, you know, there was no depression, but, you know, um, max assist to min assist for different um, activities there. Um, the caregiver burden was, was moderate. And then the pre and post outcomes they're looking at were the COPM and goal attainment scaling. Next slide. 
So I think it's interesting here to take a look at this. There were two sessions provided prior to trying to do any intervention just to build rapport and really honor and understand the goal choices of the family, which is so important. Um, the OT spent two hours creating the intervention specific to the client's strengths and limitations, so this really does take a lot of time on our part, and I think that sometimes is the restriction. You know, we don't get a lot of support for that often. Um, they considered adaptive equipment and different modifications to the environment. Um, the OT developed a sequence of steps, so thinking about that task analysis, right, for training in each goal, and you can see there that dosage of two to three hours a day, five days a week for two weeks. Wow. Um, the goal was initiated with that block practice, thinking of motor learning, um, carried out to the tolerance with some breaks given as needed for fatigue, and they were utilizing errorless learning through hand-over-hand -hand assistance, um, giving a physical cue, and eventually downgrading that to gestural and verbal cues. And this cannot be underestimated. Trying to give that verbal praise, that motivation, so we're really letting someone know when they've done a good job at each at the end of each step. Next slide. The results here I think are really interesting. You notice goal one, getting up from the recliner, um, had a, a good improvement in the COPM and met the level of performance in the goal attainment scale. Goal number three, putting on glasses, improved in the COPM and the goal attainment scale went beyond expected. The important thing to note is with those two, it said in the, the case study that it was more standby assistance or physical assistance. Goal number two for brushing teeth, um, she was expected to follow um, a picture sequence with some assistance. And you notice that's well, the one that had no improvement. There was no change. So I think that considering the visuospatial, those visual issues around um, LBD and looking at these outcomes, maybe where we might think of doing a picture schedule often for Alzheimer's or different types of dementia, it might not be the best approach for somebody with LBD. Next slide. And with that, I'm going to hand the microphone over to Heather Hodges. Thanks, Heather. Thank you so much. I think that there's so much to already think about and consider um, from the presentations of the different disciplines. And um, it's been so interesting to listen and also to be hearing about some of the ways that our professions um, overlap and also complement one another. So I will be speaking now to the voice, cognition, and swallowing aspects of the speech-language pathologist when treating uh, Lewy body dementia. Next slide. All right, so when considering the aspects of what the SLP will be evaluating and training when providing a whole body, a whole person treatment plan. We will discuss voice and speech, communication. I love the um, slide that Julia just presented uh, several slides back on communication strategies and fully um, echo those. It's a wonderful way of overlapping and, and again, complementing treatment when sharing a patient um, amongst the different disciplines. Um, also ensuring that you are um, avoiding pronouns when talking to somebody with Lewy body dementia. So when telling a story, perhaps um, it's a spouse talking about the daughter in the family and instead of saying she or her, instead using her name um, throughout the sentences, throughout the discourse, such as Jessica started a new job today. Jessica said she really enjoyed it and had a great first day. Um, that can absolutely help to avoid confusion. Um, and of course, the other things that Julia mentioned, um, I also will encourage people to echo to their patients and the caregivers. Uh, we will also be looking at cognitive linguistic changes, as well as dysphagia and feeding. And as Heather and Julia mentioned, 
the focus within speech pathology is not just helping the patient, but also working with care partner training, um, educating, motivating. We'll talk a bit about a study regarding space retrieval for safe swallow recommendations and that collaboration with OT and PT. And I also added in here, um, a registered dietitian may also be beneficial to collaborate, brainstorm, or to refer to when working with someone with dysphagia and Lewy body dementia. Next slide. So when we think about voice and speech disorders, um, many of the underlying pathology as well as the characteristics may be similar to what you see in Parkinson disease, even in idiopathic Parkinson disease. That bradykinesia, the slowness of movement, the hypokinesia with reduced amplitude of movement. And so with that, when patients are referred um, during your voice and speech screening or evaluation, you may encounter reduced loudness, mono loudness, Worse, harsh or breathy voice quality, sort of that classic hypoadducted voice, um, monotone voice, and imprecise articulation. But I want to point out that in those with Lewy body dementia, you may note more of the bradykinesia associated changes to voice and speech, and less of the hypokinesia, less of the um, their loudness may not be as reduced or their pitch range may not be as reduced as someone with idiopathic Parkinson disease. And it's important to keep these small differentiations in mind as you are part of a team, in not just interdisciplinary within rehab, but also within um, uh, communicating with the neurology um, colleagues and referral sources if you're seeing some of these differences in that evaluation or throughout a treatment course. When also looking at the cognitive linguistic characteristics, Ash et al. published a really nice um, uh, study where they looked at 35 patients. Um, they were all individuals who fell along a spectrum of Lewy body disorder. And so that included non-demented Parkinson's patients, patients with Parkinson disease dementia or PDD, and those with um, dementia with Lewy body, so the, the DLB. And so another differentiation it can be subtle, but if you are um, attuned into this, I think it's good for uh, those patients who perhaps are in the beginning stages of their uh, workup or diagnosis with the neurology team or within uh, that idea of the one year rule um, of onset of, of different changes that helps to define whether someone has Parkinson's disease with dementia or dementia with Lewy body. And so I'll point out here, those with Parkinson's disease had more reduced speech fluency, and that was characterized just by an overall reduction in their speech rate, and that in between sentences, there were long pauses. People with um, LBSD had more of a reduced speech rate that correlated with measures of between utterance pauses versus an overall speech rate reduction. And they had more executive functioning and grammatical comprehension um, issues and um, uh, delays when those became more complicated. When assessing the voice, speech, and cognitive linguistic changes, uh, some of the tools that you may use, we'll start with the voice and speech aspects, would be intelligibility. Um, patients that I've worked with have responded quite well to LSVT Loud, um, which we'll talk about further later in the presentation, um, but those who are certified, as you know, there's an assessment with a stimulability testing component to see how loudness affects voice and speech. You may do other voice assessments um, as part of a screening if you are in a setting that's looking at the whole person within an hour um, and not looking at each 
um, assessment as a separate session, um, just depending on your on your facility type and your placement. A motor speech evaluation that may also be telling for more of the hypokinetic changes um, versus maybe some of the atypical findings that don't fall within the hypokinetic dysarthria characteristics that are normally found in Parkinson's disease. With anybody undergoing a voice um, assessment or a voice therapy, um, certainly having the patient complete visualization of the larynx, the gold standard for that being an ENT exam uh, with stroboscopy, um, but may also look like a speech pathologist passing um, the scope or perhaps an indirect mirror exam. Um, um, from the referring physician to just get an evaluation, a good look at the overall health of the larynx, particularly um, because many disorders can cause voice changes in addition to underlying Lewy body dementia or underlying Parkinson disease. And so you want to have good clearance that someone is ready for voice exercise and that there's no other comorbidity occurring. Cognitive linguistic, Julie did a great job of outlining some of those assessments and I would echo those here as well. Um, I have listed here also um, the Boston naming test, which is more looking at um, uh, aphasia that can be very um, insightful into uh, the linguistic skills of people with dementia. And also the cookie theft, picture description um, taken from the by the Boston. And so that might also be a way to incorporate a, a briefer screening than doing the, the full assessment from the Boston naming test. Um, as Julia mentioned, the visual spatial and some of those relationships um, that we see being a deficit in people with uh, LBD can really be parsed out um, with the, the description of the cookie theft picture. And when we look at the research, um, you know, we know that isolation and that people who maybe in the beginning of their disease aren't symptomatic for overt speech deficits, um, just the changes that are occurring. Um, can lead to feelings of embarrassment um, if they're having hallucinations, if they're having issues with getting, you know, disoriented, getting lost within familiar settings, the social stigma, all of this can lead to decreased voice use. And as with anything um, motor, if we aren't using it, we're losing it. And so we don't want to um, advance or make the voice and speech changes progress more rapidly by somebody isolating. Um, a really nice webinar from UCSF and Stanford Medical School um, summarized very nicely that voice changes, poor attention, confusion, and word finding problems are very common. And that these impairments in communication for those with Lewy body dementia can lead to increases in anxiety or agitation. And so you can see where sometimes things become a cycle or a vicious loop that folks can get into. And it really definitely matters. Um, when we look at voice and speech, uh, some people may not think that a horse voice is something to prioritize necessarily, um, but knowing that there's other underlying aspects and giving folks confidence in the ability that they have, I think really can help so much to um, keep folks engaged, keep them motivated, and also to keep the caregivers engaged in a meaningful way. Next slide. So looking at another aspect of the speech language pathologist workup is certainly with swallowing. Um, so I'll talk now about dysphagia and feeding and highlight some of the research behind. So all of these components of um, 
uh, impairment of underlying etiology can impact swallowing. And there is, just as with voice or speech, there is some evidence that there's more pharyngeal involvement in people with Lewy body dementia that may be more associated with bradykinesia. Um, hypokinesia can also be present, but bradykinesia may be more of the problematic or more troublesome underlying physiological component. And there are also non-motor aspects, certainly, um, that can impact swallowing, um, even without an over weakness occurring, which certainly can happen. But even in the uh, beginning phases when swallowing may overall look fairly normal, um, confusion, hallucinations, those can absolutely affect eating behavior. Um, eating and swallowing absolutely can be, um, you know, just with anybody, a, a level of distraction can cause more of an airway compromise. But when you are dealing with people with dementia, with Lewy body dementia, uh, these can really become quite impactful. And what we see may occur if swallowing changes, if people's feeding behaviors um, change. We may see dehydration, malnutrition, um, difficulty taking medication to try to swallow um, a pill with water uh, can be a very difficult thing to coordinate that many of us take for granted. And so the most impactful component or, or repercussion, I should say, to a swallowing disorder, a feeding disorder, or dysphagia is aspiration pneumonia. And so the bottom line is that dysphagia really can have major repercussions and multifactorial bases. And we see that with Parkinson, also with Lewy body dementia, um, patients who are presenting with Parkinsonian-like symptoms, that rigidity and bradykinesia, um, they underlie volitional speech abnormality as well as the disordered volitional stages of swallowing, particularly the oral stage. And so those clinicians who specialize in voice and swallowing together, um, it really is something that the two Areas may seem separate, but they absolutely can uh, be impacted by the same underlying abnormalities. And so that the problems in movement scaling and sensory motor integration will characterize both. And that's why many of our patients require treatment and intervention on both simultaneously. And that can also be important to keep in mind when prioritizing therapy for your patients, where keeping things direct and simplified for someone with Lewy body dementia, you may choose an approach to address one at a time versus um, therapy that focuses in on swallowing and voice and speech together within the same day or within the same session. Um, or series of sessions, so something to consider within that. When swallowing disorders are found um, on a modified barium swallow study, on a FEES, um, we really believe and preach early intervention. And I think this is particularly important for those with dementia and Lewy body dementia in particular, um, because we want to start those routines of exercise. Um, Julie said that really nicely in her presentation as well, that establishing routines of exercise, um, exercise routines are really going to help the person um, maintain function longer, stay into a routine for longer. And so you'll take each case, of course, individually as they may come, but if somebody is able to implement exercises to strengthen swallowing or the improve coordination or to help coordinate breathing, 
breathing um, uh, or breathing muscle strength so that they maintain an efficient cough um, in case something is aspirated. These are elements that you'll consider during your treatment plan. There's a nice article from Cameron um, et al. from 2012 of spaced retrieval, where you know um, an example that you could apply this to with dysphagia may be that a patient needs to um, use a chin tuck posture, and so you are systematically um, giving them cues, reminding them at spaced intervals perhaps 10 seconds apart you know hey joe what do you want to do when you swallow thin liquid and they respond tuck my chin and then each time they're successful you make the interval longer and longer and longer and you have them repeat back or demonstrate is even more functional uh, demonstrate that back to you each time that they are asked once they uh, do not respond correctly, then you go backwards to where they were successful and um, uh, continue from that point. So that is a, a really nice article to read. And then dietary um, considerations. There's some really interesting research that I'll present here in a moment, but dietary considerations, um, of course, calorie intake, particularly if you have someone who is eating less um, as a result of hallucinations or confusion, um, you may collaborate or get recommendations from a registered dietitian on how the caregivers can uh, provide a high calorie diet to the patient so that they really are maximizing their energy reserves. As we know, with swallowing, viscosity matters because of timing, and that's particularly good to keep in mind when we think about bradykinesia, um, perhaps being more of a troublesome area for people with Lewy body dementia. We'll talk a bit about sensory in a moment here, and then candidacy for free water, that idea of drinking plain water outside of meal times, implementing good oral hygiene so that hydration is maintained even in the face of possible aspiration. If clean water from a clean oral cavity is aspirated, um, there's nice evidence that the bacterial infections uh, may not set in. And so quickly, I'd like to share with you some of the research on swallowing interventions. Um, the first of which is super important um, and I saw um, echoed in many different resources. So um, it's great to point out that thickened liquids, um, Flynn et al. from 2018 Cochrane Review, you know, they had a, a great summary statement that thickening fluids may have an immediate positive effect on swallowing. So perhaps when thickened liquid is swallowed, it moves more slowly, gives the airway time to close and protect itself. So there might be that impact that we see on a modified barium swallow study and think that might be a recommended solution. However, the long-term impact of thickened liquid on the health of the person with dementia should be considered. Um, if they're not motivated to drink a thickened liquid, then we're going to see hydration suffer, nutrition suffer. There may be more agitation around drinking, um, more discord at home as a result. And so food modification um, for dysphagia management in these studies um, there's there's not a lot of studies out there, and certainly there needs to be more, but at this point, many um, experts within the field of dementia um, really just, they don't love the idea of thickened liquids. They just don't see that the cost to benefit is really um, that helpful. And so consider the patient and caregiver burden. Discuss the solid or liquid um, diet modification impact with those caregivers, with the patient. If it is a burden and compliance may be an issue or it may exacerbate other um, components of the dementia, then per, it might not be indicated for those patients. The same line of thinking was applied to feeding tubes um, in advanced dementia. 
the research demonstrated it didn't show a benefit in regards to survival of patients, to the improvement in the quality of their lives, or even in a reduction in the aspiration pneumonia. So really important to consider. We definitely support the idea of assessing early, assessing often, and assessing through um, gold standard visualization, whether it be a fees um, or a video fluoroscopic exam, um, also known as a modified barium swallow study. So this is a really great um, support for that. 26 patients with um, uh, Lewy body dementia reported swallowing difficulties. And when those uh, 26 patients were examined under a modified barium swallow study, um, 24 of the 26 did indeed have objective findings of dysphagia. And of those 24, 88%, it was a pharyngeal dysphagia. It was a pharyngeal dysfunction that occurred. And so almost all patients with Lewy body dementia or Parkinson disease uh, with dementia had those subjective signs of dysphagia and, and that was absolutely correlated with findings on modified barium swallow study. And the modified barium swallow study or fees is a place to try compensatory techniques. And keeping in mind that you not only look at what is keeping the airway safe and protected, but also what the patient is able to do. And thinking about if they're able to do it there with you in the fluoroscopy suite at the time of the evaluation. And also, are they able to do this at home? What's the feasi feasibility um, of that? And so there really are those clinical implications and just highlighting the importance of asking your physicians for that order for a modified barium swallow study or fees to examine the function and prevent those complications on, on aspiration. I talked a bit about sensory. So um, this is sort of background information on this slide about the effects of carbonated liquid on oropharyngeal swallowing measures in people with neurogenic dysphagia. Um, in the interest of time, I won't go through these details, but I wanted to include it here as it helped be the underlying um, reason for another study that looked specifically on the use of carbonated liquid when um, on swallowing dysfunction and dementia with Lewy body. And so 48 participants were referred for a modified barium swallow study. And there was descriptive um, overall assessment that was provided. Uh, the idea being that carbonated beverages may uh, have more sensory input on the patient swallow and increased sensory input may help with uh, timing and safety of swallowing. And indeed their findings on the next slide do indicate this um, to some degree. So 40 of the 48 patients had a swallowing dysfunction. And again, the pharyngeal type of dysfunction was supported in this study as well. And with this, 87% of those with a swallowing dysfunction had over, overall improvement when they were drinking carbonated liquid. Even thin liquid carbonated beverages um, was affected. And in fact, the pharyngeal transit time for carbonated liquid was faster for thin liquid and, and thickened liquid. Um, and there was no significant effect when um, they were observing for residue or penetration. Um, the prior study did show that penetration was decreased for small boluses. I think it was five cc's of uh, thin liquid carbonated beverage. So um, some really nice and more palatable, certainly, <laughs> carbonated beverages. Oh, over a thickened beverage um, might be more palatable. 
that was also supported in the prior study on your reference slide above. And that's great news for caregivers and for patients with Lewy body dementia to keep them hydrated, keep them drinking and have some assurance that safety is improved um, and pharyngeal transit time also being improved. So with that, a uh, quick summary, I'd love to hand things back over to Laura and she can talk more about the benefit of LSVT Lab and LSVT Big on patients with LBD. Hi, thanks so much, Heather. That was a great presentation, really interesting to me as a physical therapist, so thank you for that. Um, a lot of you on our webinar tonight are already LSVT certified, so I'm not going to be going in depth about the LSVT protocols, but we'll be going through some slides and, and they're here for your reference as well. There will also be a case study at the end of this that we'd love for you to just look at, read on your own uh, as a way of um, really depicting how these protocols can work together to support someone with um, dementia of Lewy bodies or uh, PDD. So please do look for those in your handouts. But really the basic things that we want to go through are what are the framework and the key principles of LSVT Loud and LSVT Big, thinking about how those might benefit or support people with um, Lewy body dementia and how would it look like in action, and again, through that case study. So for those of you that are familiar with LSVT Loud and LSVT Big, you know that they're standardized research-based specific protocols that were initially developed for people with idiopathic Parkinson's disease. We have a common target of amplitude, so working on bigness of movement or loudness of voice, rescaling to normal again. The mode is intensive and a high effort. And also our goal is calibration because we want our patients not just to improve in uh, the treatment room through our queuing, but really learn how to um, have more lasting success. In the case of people with dementia, sometimes that comes through caregiver training on how to cue them um, externally. For people with idiopathic Parkinson's disease, uh, without dementia, we're often looking for improved internal cueing mechanisms. So that target of loudness or bigness is a single target, and what we find is that it drives activation across the motor systems. Through this simple cue, there's a lot of different things that change. You, you know, it might be increased respiratory capacity, mouth opening, articulation, um, listener perception. There's many, many things that improve with this simple cue of loud. Same thing with this simple cue of big. You might see improvements in stride length, posture, um, arm swing, speed of movement through this simple cue of big. The mode is intensive. For those of you familiar with LSVT Big and LSVT Loud, you know that they're each uh, one month long treatments where the patient is seen intensively four consecutive days a week for four weeks as the minimum dosage, 60 minute sessions. It's individualized therapy. Uh, it's very much personalized, so it can't be group therapy. And the patients also get daily homework and carryover exercises all 30 days of the month always delivered by LSVT certified clinicians. And our goal is to not only improve function, but maintain function lifelong. In the LSVT loud treatment session, they do a, a number of daily exercises, working on improving um, volume of their voice, improving loudness through these repetitive exercises. The second half of the treatment, really using that improved loudness, that improved quality of voice, through functional communication tasks called hierarchy exercises. And then the patient also have homework and carryover exercises so that they're mandated to use that better life voice in real life. And so the treatment session is two parts, core exercises to rescale their amplitude and teaching them how to translate that into functional salient individualized goals. And for people with advanced dementia, it might even be simple basic needs such as I need to use the restroom or making a call um, to an emergency service if needed. For LSVT Big, we have a similar structure. We have maximal daily exercises working on large amplitude movements in all planes. And then we have functional activities and hierarchy exercises as well as big walking, teaching them how to use that big amplitude in functional activities that are very much personalized to them. So it can be adapted to people that are uh, low level in terms of their abilities and very high level in terms of their abilities as well. 
Just like with LSBT Loud, they receive daily homework and carry over exercises. So same principles, core amplitude rescaling exercises, and then teach them how to use these bigger movements in functional, salient, and individualized goals. Calibration is a theme across both treatments. We know that in um, Lewy body dementia and in Parkinson's disease, there are barriers to generalization. There's a sensory disorder. They don't always feel that their voice is too soft or their movements are too small. There's problems with internal cueing mechanisms that are broken, and there's neuropsychological problems that have been identified um, pretty extensively during this webinar. And so we recognize that these disorders are more than movement disorders. We see these movement problems of bradykinesia and hypokinesia that take a lot of repetition effort to be able to rescale to more normal volume where people can hear them, or more normal movement that's efficient and good quality. But there's also sensory hallmarks of Parkinsonisms. Um, the movement might feel quite normal to them, but clearly as clinicians and even laypersons, we can see that it's smaller than normal. Their voice sounds normal to them, but we know that it's too quiet and people around them are always asking them to speak up. So one of the reasons, well, there's many reasons you can see here that the LSVT protocols might be a good fit for people with cognitive impairments because of the simplicity and repetition of cueing. It's either one cue, think loud or think big. They practice simple things over and over and over again. They practice things that are individualized to them and are salient to them. The exercises can improve function and we know that exercise is really important as Heather said early on in her presentation to reduce frailty, to improve their overall um, condition, their wellness, to prevent secondary complications as well. It's motivating, empowering for people with Lewy body dementia to be able to have a reduced burden of care and be able to have more autonomy in either their communication, ADLs, or movement. All the tasks are very specific to them. So we're not looking at workbooks or working on, you know, um, non-purposeful things like rainbow arc or reaching for cones. We're really working on functional tasks such as, you know, getting their own pants on, um, getting in and out of bed more independently, communication activities that are important to them. And for care partners, it's very easy to learn how to cue because they don't have to memorize a set of procedures or instructions. So we can all work together, um, speech therapists, uh, both for communication and swallowing, physical therapists, occupational therapists, and for many of our patients with Lewy body dementia, they need all of it. But you might be wondering, what order do I do it in? Do I do it all at once or not? And every patient is different, of course. So you might have instances where you do LSVT loud first, if dysphagia is mild or non-existent. Um, you might um, do dysphagia treatment first if you need to. So, and you might do it concurrently. So it really, there's lots of different factors um, that weigh into that. And I would say you need to really understand your patient fully and the problems that they might be experiencing or not experiencing related to voice and swallowing so that you can better make that decision. For PT and OT, LSVT big can be delivered in a combined approach so that PT and OT are um, sharing the patient essentially. It really is great for the client because it comprehensively addresses their needs. Typically, two days a week are PT, two days a week are OT, but you might be wondering how that works. Each discipline needs to have its own plan of care, and so it needs to have its own goals, and they can be seeing um, the same patient for the same condition, but they need to have their own goals and their own scope of practice. And so we're looking at using amplitude as a means of achieving those discipline specific goals. And just like I said, um, typically this is how it's done. We decide upon the functional component tasks together. And also they could have one big hierarchy task, which is a complex functional task, or they could have separate hierarchy tasks as well. And if you're not certified, you'll learn all about that in the LSVT big certific certification course if you decide to take it in the future. Documentation is super important. You need to document what is the impairment and deficit and really support it, describe it, support it with outcome measures that really uh, demonstrate that this deficit exists. Documenting prior level function is always an important thing as well. 
and ask yourself, is there a reasonable expectation of improvement or prevention, slowing of decline or injury? But rem remember that clients do not have to show improvement to be covered by Medicare. Really what's necessary is that it's skilled and it's deemed medically necessary. So look at your goals. Are they realistic? Do they include the care partner? And are you supporting why what you are doing is skilled? So in, um, the, the, uh, in honor of your time, I'm not going to go through all of these case study slides, but I would like you to take time and read it because it's a real case of someone, we'll call him Jim, that had uh, dementia of, with Lewy bodies. And it describes how the LSVT big protocol was um, delivered and how also the LSVT loud protocol was delivered to very personally and specifically meet Jim's needs. And so if you have any questions about that, certainly reach out um, to our presenters tonight who put together this case study for you. So uh, in basic summary, Lewy body dementia is a complex condition that benefits from the unique skills of all three disciplines, right? We focus on function, safety, and engagement and meaningful activity to promote quality of life for all people with Lewy body dementia. LSVT Big and LSVT Loud provide a framework to address functional needs, safety, and engagement in salient activities to promote quality of life, both for the person with Lewy body dementia and the care partner. So in just a moment, we're going to take questions and Julia is going to give you a little bit of information on some resources from the um, LBDA as well. But before that, I just want you to tell, to tell you that there is going to be a community webinar. So if you have clients right now, friends or family, people you know with Lewy, Lewy body dementia, the three of them will be presenting a webinar tomorrow intended for people with living with Lewy as well as their caregivers um, from 2 to 3 p.m. Eastern. You can actually, um, I says, don't register from your clinician account. Actually go to the um, blog. It's blog.lsvtglobal.com. Click on the events and they can find that webinar. It will be recorded as well. So if you have future clients that would benefit from hearing more about that and about how LSVT can be used to address some of those problems, um, that'll be available for you in an on-demand version to share with your clients in the future. So I'm gonna share um, the screen uh, with Julia. She's gonna tell you a little bit about this. While she's doing that, please begin to type your questions into the control panel and we'll answer as many as we can. Thank you so much, Laura, and thank you everyone for your time and your attention tonight. Um, so much great information. Um, I hope we didn't throw too much at you, um, but I just wanted to leave you with some resources, both for yourself and, you know, potentially your clients or friends or family. Um, at LBDA, we are the only national health organization that is dedicated solely to Lewy body dementias. So we're working to raise awareness, to advance the diagnosis, promote advances with science, and also support people that are living with Lewy, their families and their caregivers, because ultimately our goal is to reduce the burden um, on families living with Lewy body dementia. Next slide. We have a lot of educational resources, a couple of those um, we put in the chat for tonight. Um, we're gonna be working on developing more live and virtual events for both lay and professional audiences. Um, and we have a lot of free patient handouts and things that you can download on our website at www.lbda.org. Next slide. Um, our research centers of excellence, which Jennifer um, mentioned, Dr. Goldman mentioned that she is at the Shirley Ryan Ability Lab. Um, they're really working in those centers to drive advanced clinical trials and give support for patients, families, and providers. And we are working to develop a Lewy trial tracker that is coming soon. So if you have clients who are interested in how to find uh, research studies that they could participate in, that will be a great resource. Next slide. 
And it's important to note our support services. We have a Louie line that is not like a hotline that you call 24 hours a day and somebody answers, but you call and it's for people living with Louie and their loved ones. And we have a social worker who mans that phone and she can call you back and help connect you uh, with support as needed. There are also virtual support groups um, that through four closed Facebook groups for care partners and people living with Louie body dementia. And you're always welcome to email our support services at support at lbda.org. Next slide. We have care briefs and publications on our website that you are welcome to download as well. You can also order copies, hard copies, if you would like to, to have them um, sent to your clinic. Next slide. And now we go to the questions. Excellent. So you'll notice here you can type your, your questions in the, um, the control panel. You can also raise your hand. Um, if you need to run, we understand. You can always email us at info at lsvtglobal.com. And there are always office hours weekly um, from 8 to 8.30 um, Eastern Time. And so for LSVT Big, that's on Tuesday, and LSVT Loud on Wednesday. I'm going to hand it back over to Laura. Thank you all so much. All right. Uh, thank you, Julia. And I just want to leave some information with you here as well. Our email addresses and websites again. If you do have to run, um, just remember that there will be a survey that pops up on the screen once you exit the webinar. If you miss that, it will also be emailed to you within 24 hours of the webinar. And it should take only five minutes or less to complete. Um, so with that, I'll leave this screen up and I'm going to open up the question panel and we're going to see what kind of questions have come in. And also, um, if we have a lot of questions, I know Julia and I can stay for a few minutes after the hour. Um, all right, let's see. Is this program available in Southern California? And in thinking, wondering if you're think, asking about the LSVT programs. Um, if so, yes, we have clinicians really all over the world, um, many in the United States. If you go on the LSVT Global website, there's a big orange button in the top right-hand corner that says find LSVT clinicians, and then you can put in the clinician type that you're looking for either an LSVT Loud Certified Speech Therapist or an LSVT Big Certified Physical or Occupational Therapist. Put in your um, city and state or your zip code and up will pop everyone who's certified in your area. So you can reach out and find someone. And if that wasn't your question, um, I think that was Brenda, just maybe confirm. Um, okay, I think there was a question here about a neck brace. Would you recommend neck braces when neck dystonia increases? Um, Heather, would you mind taking that one? Oh, sure. Um, so it depends on where the dystonia is. You know, if you have someone who has the torticollis that's kind of pushing them back in the posterior area, right? So that they're looking up, um, certainly, a lot of the movement disorder specialists will use Botox for that, and that can be helpful if you have somebody who has an anticollis who falls forward. Of course, Botox is not good for that because of the um, proximity to speech and swallowing and issues with that, so they don't usually use Botox. Um, dystonia is a tricky thing. Um, sometimes the braces can work. Sometimes the dystonia is much too powerful um, for them and it ends up causing more problems. What I always like to do is get in touch with my prosthetic orthotic team and have them do an assessment of the patient once um, we know that they've been medically managed to the best of the movement disorder specialist ability um, through the medication and if, if the ability for Botox. So not, not a great answer for you, but for some people it can work. Um, um, in the minority um, is probably helpful and the majority of people it's it's very difficult all right thanks Heather and Dr. Goldman did you have anything else that you would like to add from a medical perspective about that thanks can you can you hear me okay yes can hear you okay. just fine yeah I think that was a really good answer from 
Heather, and it sort of depends on the direction and angle of the dystonia. Uh, and I think in particular, when the neck is flexed, we want to make sure that we don't interfere with anything that could compromise swallowing. But if the head or neck's in a, in a different position, then it may be more amenable to botulinum toxin injections. So again, I think it's an opportunity for movement disorder neurologists and neurologists to work hand in hand with physical therapy and, and other disciplines. Okay, thank you so much. Um, Heather, Julia, I'll, I'll leave this up to either one of you. Um, it's just asking, do you think the power program versus LSVT would also be beneficial as um, a more individualized program? I'd love to comment. Heather Kent may too, okay. yeah. <laughs> if I could. Um, the, I think the big difference, you know, I, I, I love power. I'm certified in it as well. But if you notice, there was really an overarching theme throughout all of the literature that we presented on function. And so really looking at doing functional tasks. And so, you know, there are exercises with power, but it's you're not really using those to do the functional component tasks, the hierarchies, all of those things that are meaningful and engaging to that individual. And as much as exercise is important and we want people to be active, we want them to move, we want to preserve strength and range of motion, we have to make sure that if we're going to, you know, override the apathy, you know, the depression, a lot of these neuropsychiatric symptoms, it's really important that we support function and that we we work on things that are goals for the individual, things that are meaningful to their life and their participation, to their roles in their family and in their community. So I think that both are fine for exercise, but I feel like you always have to be addressing function. And that's where I feel, you know, the, the functional aspects of LSVT big um, and loud are, are really important for this population. Anything you want to add, Heather? No, I was just going to say two thumbs up from my side of the neck over here. Totally. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you. Um, let's see. I'm just seeing. Um, there was a question about um, Dr. Goldman, if you would be willing to share a handout of your slides post webinar. Um, some key points I'd like to review. Yeah, I'm happy to work with uh, Julia and you all to uh, okay. to look at the, the slides. Okay, thank, you. thank thank you. So we can email those to you um, post webinar, and also we can share the handouts that are in the handout um, control panel right now in case you weren't able to access those tonight. Okay, I'm just looking, and I think there was a question that came in about meds that block dopamine production that got answered um, in the question box. And that's all of the questions that I hear tonight. So that's great. Okay, well, I just want to respect everyone's time. And most of all, I want to thank our wonderful panelists, uh, Dr. Goldman, um, Heather, Julia, and Heather for your fantastic information today in depth about Louis de body dementia. I personally learned so much. I hope you all did too. And um, we'll see you for our next webinar. Please um, be sure if you're an LSVT certified clinician to check out your LSVT clinician account for upcoming webinars. Otherwise, if you're not, we'd love to have you join us again for webinars. You can find them at blog dot lsvtglobal.com and they're under the events tab and also um, we have pre uh, our pre-recorded webinars or our previously recorded webinars are found under the webinars tab um, and i think there's just one last question that came in if we could let's see i think oh okay dr goldman are you willing to answer that question about the meds that block dopamine production? Oh, sure. Yeah. I okay, did. thanks. Uh, yeah, I don't think we finished that in the, in the chat. So um, okay. this is a great question. And uh, so the two medicines that were mentioned in the chat uh, include tetrabenazine and dutetrabenazine. And these two medicines 
may deplete uh, dopamine and other brain chemicals that are called monoamines. They're a little bit different from the dopamine blocking medicines I mentioned, but these two medicines uh, work by blocking the signal between the neurons that are involved in uh, chemicals called monoamines. Um, but they are often used for hyperkinetic disorders to lessen those movements. On the other hand, kind of related to them are medicines that are dopamine blocking. And when we think about these, they're often um, used as antipsychotics or neuroleptics, or sometimes anti-nausea medicines. And common ones that you might hear about include haloperidol or risperdal, aripiprazole and, and so forth. And the challenge or, or on the nausea and things like metoclopramide or compazine or phenergan. And the challenge with these dopamine blocking medicines is they negate the action of, of dopamine and in many patients with Lewy body dementia can lead to marked worsening of the Parkinsonism and other complications. So we really try to avoid those at all costs if possible. But thanks for uh, opportunity to clarify yeah. that. Well, thank you. And thank you so much for providing your insights tonight and joining us. And with that, I'm going to close the, tonight's webinar. Thank you all again, and hopefully we'll see you soon. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you.